Hi viewers, I hope you have a fantastic weekend. Today we have a special subject which links to criminal justice system and it's a very important when we talk about the defense at the same time we talk about the prosecution. And today we are honored that our special guest is Martin Goldman. He is chief prosecutor for the Yorkshire and Humber. Welcome in our show. Thank you for the invite. Uh, Martin, tell us and our viewers about your early days and your uh, qualifications. Uh, well, I'm qualified as a lawyer. I qualified unusually from Dundee University. Uh, I did my degree in Dundee because I enjoy golf. And so I wanted to play golf as well as study for law. Uh, I then qualified in Liverpool, where I was born. Uh, joined a firm of solicitors in Liverpool, joined the CPS from there, uh, and have stayed with the CPS for the last 25 years. So which year you joined CPS? I joined the CPS in 1989, at the, towards the end of 1989. And as I say, I joined as a trainee solicitor uh, and have worked my way along for 25 years, and now uh, I'm the Chief Crown Prosecutor. So when you were qualifying as a solicitor, at that time, is there was any ideal personality for you you have idealized in your year? Um, in terms of my future career, um, what I wanted to be always was a prosecutor. And I've always wanted to be a prosecutor ever since I was a teenager. Uh, I was always interested in politics. Uh, I did politics for my, one of my A-levels at school. Uh, and so um, uh, uh, understanding about criminal justice, which is always a very big politics topic, it's always something that's in the media, always something that's being talked about. Uh, was, it was something that interested, interested me. And so I always had that view that being a prosecutor would be a, a very good career choice. And how many staff you have in your team? Uh, we have about 550 staff. Um, and uh, 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 they spread over our Leeds office, our uh, Sheffield office, and our Hull office. And when we talk about the trial prosecution, sometimes it happens that the victim of crime, they are not happy with the outcome of the result of the case. Yes. So what are the remedies available for the victim of the crime? Uh, well, we certainly treat the victim with a lot more respect now, uh, uh, and we make sure we cater for their needs during the prosecution. We do our very best when a case is being prosecuted uh, to keep them in touch with the case, to make sure they understand what's happening with the case to make sure their needs are catered for. So we do a lot in terms of special measures now. Uh, so we have uh, screens in court, video evidence, um, interpreters, intermediaries. Um, so we do a lot to cater for the needs of victims. But if in the end we don't proceed with a case and the victim is unhappy with that, uh, the CPS have been the very first to introduce a victim's right of review. And so a victim has entitled now to challenge the, the decision that we've made. Uh, it get, then goes to another part of the CPS, independent of Yorkshire and Humberside, and it gets a second review to make sure that the review that we've done uh, is of the right quality. And sometimes they say we've made an, an incorrect decision and we go ahead with the case. Sometimes it happens that the Crown prosecution has prosecuted the uh, accused, but what happened, the outcome was not as the uh, you know, four C reasons are as per expectation of the victim. So what are the remedies for them? For the victim in those circumstances? Yes. Um, well, justice has to flow. Uh, and so uh, the CPS can prosecute. If we convict uh, a defendant of an offence, then they stand before a judge and the judge will sentence them. If, this, if it's a serious offence uh, and the judge, we think the judge has made a lenient sentence, then we can appeal that sentence to the Court of Appeal. Uh, that takes the consent of the Attorney General, and we, uh, we have regularly applied to the Attorney General uh, to have sentences that we think are too light appealed to the Court of Appeal to make them uh, a heavier sentence, and sometimes we succeed. So how complicated is this procedure for Crown Prosecution to go and apply for the, uh, that office to get the consent? Uh, it's not that complicated. We have to do things in a rush uh, because we only have 28 days to get the entire thing done uh, and before the Court of Appeal. So uh, if a victim uh, said to us that they thought the sentence was too light, 
uh, a week after the sentence, it means we've only got three weeks left. If they say it two weeks after the sentence, then we've only got two weeks left. So we're always trying to make sure that we get as early a notification as we can um, so that we've got the maximum time. If we have that time, then we'll get it done. For our viewers' interest, what is the history of Crown Prosecution Service uh, in quick summary and how you have seen over the years it has changed? Yes, well, that's an interesting question. The uh, Crown Prosecution Service only came into existence in 1986, which is relatively recent given that the police service have been around for 150 years. Um, and the reason why the CPS was set up was to provide an independent and objective decision around who should or should not be prosecuted. Because it was believed at the time in the 1980s uh, that the police who investigate cases, if they also prosecute them, then they're prosecuting people who shouldn't be prosecuted because they've already uh, put a lot of time and effort into the investigation. Uh, so the CPS was set up to make sure that people who shouldn't be prosecuted are definitely not prosecuted because we make decisions on the evidence, uh, on the Code for Crown Prosecutors, and the fact that the police might have done a lot of work uh, doesn't mean that we should automatically prosecute. Uh, and so since the CPS was set up in 1986, uh, we've developed quite a lot. So we didn't just, we started out just prosecuting uh, for the police, uh, but since 1986, we've now taken on uh, charging responsibility, so the police aren't allowed to charge unless uh, the CPS say so. Uh, and we've also taken on a lot of our own advocacy, so we send our prosecutors into the Crown Court and into the Magistrates Court. Uh, so we've developed our, the range of our skills and the range of our influence. So what are the average of per year cases Crown prosecution under your leadership deals in the whole of the region? The average what? Cases, sorry? how many number of cases um, you how deal How many? With? Well, Yorkshire and Humberside is the third biggest region in the country. Uh, so we, we will prosecute about 55 to 60,000 cases a year. Um, that includes about uh, 100 homicide cases, about four or 500 rape cases, about 12 or 1,300 uh, sex, sexual abuse cases, uh, thousands of burglary cases and theft cases and assault cases, as well as some of the minor cases like road traffic cases or uh, minor uh, assaults or public disorders. So how you see that in coming days, how Crown Prosecution will progress in next 10 years? Um, that's an interesting question because, of course, in these days when government departments are contracting, uh, we're having less staff to do what we need to do. Uh, I think in the next 10 years, the Crown Prosecution Service will become far more digital. The whole criminal justice system will become far more digital. I think there'll be a lot more dealt with online, a lot more criminal work dealt with online. It'll look very different to how it looks today. Uh, but I think that the CPS will still have a big presence in the big cases that are in the Crown Court, in trials in the Magistrates Court. It's just I think they'll be handled a little bit differently. And if somebody wants to apply especially for the prosecutor's role, what is the procedure and how they can apply? Um, well, at the moment, we're not recruiting because, as I say, um, the, uh, like with other government uh, departments or, or, or uh, government-funded organisations, uh, we're contracting rather than expanding. But we are taking on legal trainees uh, and the CPS nationally. The CPS is a national organisation and the CPS nationally advertises for legal trainees. And Yorkshire and Humberside is a very good record of uh, being part of that uh, intake. So we take... Um, up to three legal trainees every year. Uh, we promote two internally, uh, so we have people who are qualifying and are sponsored by ourselves uh, to go and encouraged by ourselves to get legal qualifications and we give them training contracts, but we also take people from the outside as well so that we get a good balance of, of people coming through. Is there any opportunities for the youngsters who want to do some work experience? Uh, we don't do very much work experience, but uh, what we do is we have a relationship with the universities across the region. I deliver some lectures at uh, Sheffield University and Sheffield Hallam University, uh, and, we, and we allow the best performing criminal law students, because we're a criminal business, 
uh, to uh, come in to once a year to uh, have some work experience. So, so we try to match it to the universities, so we pick the best people who are most interested in criminal law to get that experience. Because your department always have a very important duty for prosecution. Every year, after all these prosecutions, yes. do you issue any white paper or any report that how the government and the agencies can minimize the crime? Um, yes, well, we, uh, the CPS nationally does an annual report, and what, what that annual report covers is all of our conviction rates, all of our caseloads, all of our results in terms of the different types of crime, like in violence against women or hate crime or theft crime uh, or serious crime or homicide, excuse me, homicide crime. Uh, and we also publish uh, all the um, uh, uh, activity we do with the police and with the prison service and with the communities about how we educate the public, how we try to reduce the incidence of crime as much as prosecute those who are, uh, who are uh, guilty of crime. So what are your procedures internally, especially in these days, while the cyber crimes, and especially interlinked and fraudulent cases are happening a lot? Yeah. So you have a special unit who deals with all these uh, investigations, or or they have any forensic teams, how they, they proceed with these type of um, complex inquiries and cases? Right, well, well, we've got within Yorkshire and Humberside, we've got two specialist teams. We've got a complex casework unit, which deals with all of the complex frauds and complex cyber crimes, uh, organized crime, uh, all of the very big international crime, the, the very complex work. And we've got a rape and serious sexual offense unit, which deals with all of the rape and serious sexual offense work, uh, which it, there's a lot of, uh, unfortunately, these days, uh, and which, uh, for, which comes up around the four counties. Um, everything else gets absorbed into the main teams. Uh, but what we do is we work closely with the police, uh, both at the investigative stage and after we've charged people with crimes, uh, to make sure that the expertise that we've got to deal with cyber crime and internet crime and, uh, and online uh, sex crime uh, is all handled in the best way. So what, uh, it's a quite interesting question for you. What happens uh, to the proceeds of crime which Crown Prosecution recovers through their prosecution system and through courts? Uh, what is the use of that money? Uh, well, it, it's a very good question because the, the most important thing to say with proceeds of crime is that because we've taken that money off the criminals, uh, it is ploughed back into the criminal justice system to give us more capability to allow us to go after more criminals. So we work closely with the police. We've got CPS prosecutors uh, based in the police uh, proceeds of crime units uh, so that we can target and uh, get as much money off the criminals as we can. And in Yorkshire and Humberside, we are uh, the second most successful of doing that in the country, nearly as successful as London. So we took uh, five or six million pounds off criminals uh, in West Yorkshire alone last year. Uh, across the region, it was about double that. And if you take into account the police who can take money directly, uh, it's a lot more than that. So we are, we are removing the, the uh, gains of criminals from them quite a lot. So is there any suggestion that this money can be used for the students who wants to specialise in criminology or any specialised degree in the universities? Um, no, the, it, it's not meant for that sort of uh, application. The proceeds of crime is meant to re uh, remove money from criminals and to give us a bit more capability to allow us uh, the capacity and expertise to go after more criminals. Uh, the, any money that's left over from that goes to the Home Office and the government uh, so that we don't have any perverse incentives. Uh, we, it, it's focused on what it needs to focus on. Do you think this money should also be part of used on the social sector like housing or parks or the facilities for the poor areas? Uh, well, definitely it is. Uh, I know talking to the police and crime commissioners, uh, for example, Alan Billings, Dr. Alan Billings in South Yorkshire, as well as Mark Burns Williamson in West Yorkshire, uh, that they plough a lot of this money that the police get back uh, into the community to do drugs rehabilitation work, to improve facilities, to improve um, the uh, community groups uh, who provide support for people who've suffered as a result of crime. So it's definitely used 
uh, to plough back into the community to improve the community as well as giving us the capacity to go after more criminals. You have conducted a lot of criminal cases. So what are the good qualities, three good qualities of good advocate? Of a good advocate? Well, preparation is really important. Uh, a good advocate should always know the case when he's going into court, when he or she is going into court. Uh, that's the most important thing. The second thing is to be able to project yourself very positively so that you can engage the court and a jury especially in the case itself. Um, so having a really good voice, a really good uh, style of talking because you've got to persuade 12 members of the public that your case is the good case uh, and also then being able to react, being able to, to, to react on your feet to things that happen in court because often things will come out uh, that you don't expect either from the defence or from the judge. The jury might ask a question. You've got to be able to be nimble in your mind so that you can answer questions quickly. And uh, what is your message for our viewers? Because a lot of youngsters are watching it, our viewers are watching it, especially the law students. What is your message? Um, I'd say being in the legal profession is a, is a very noble profession to be in. Uh, the legal profession is, um, is often uh, knocked these days uh, for all sorts of reasons, but actually when your heart's in the right place, the legal profession is a wonderful, wonderful profession to be in because you can really make a difference to people out there, whether it's in criminal law and protecting the communities from criminals, and getting criminals locked up so that they don't go on to commit crime uh, and making a difference to people's lives or whether it's in civil law or family law or tribunal work uh, it really makes a difference to people when it's handled right and for the right reasons and it's, it's a it's a very very decent profession to be in uh, and i'm very proud to be in it and who is your favorite golfer because you have mentioned that golf yes. is your favorite sport uh, jack nicklaus was my uh, favorite golfer um, because he was such a gentleman he actually was a um, a very big influence over me because he was uh, uh, he had his heart in the right place he always did the right thing um, i remember in the uh, open championship he conceded a putt to one of his uh, oppositions to um, uh, because he wanted, he didn't want to put him uh, to the test of missing a putt uh, when it wasn't right to do so. Um, and so he always did the right thing rather than just went for something irrespective of his impact on others. So he was a gentleman, he was uh, morally solid, uh, he had his heart in the right place. So, and, and golf is a game of gentle, uh, of gentlemanly uh, pursuits, so uh, I, I, I thoroughly enjoyed the game. But he was a, a hero of mine, was Jack Nicklaus. Viewers, I hope you have enjoyed today's discussion. You can join me every week on Sheffield Live. And if you have any questions, your questions will be welcome. My email is shown on your screens. Martin, thank you very much. Thank you. It's a pleasure. Thank you.